Hello, and welcome to SLP Full Disclosure. I am your host, Jennifer Martin, and I am thrilled that our guest today, uh, Shante Glover-Jones, is here to speak with us. Um, we're going to have a great conversation about incorporating diversity in your speech and language practice, and I cannot wait to learn from her. And before we get started, let me tell you a little bit about her um, because she's quite accomplished. So Shantae Glover-Jones is an author, speaker, advocate, and a certified speech language pathologist. She founded Having Our Say to create a space where children and families would feel seen, valued, and heard. Shantae is also the developer of the Equity Series, which is a professional development conference for special educators and speech language pathologists that addresses the needs of marginalized and minoritized individuals. Shantae is committed to promoting language development through literacy and increasing diversity in KidLit and has workshops and lectures on this topic across the globe. Her debut picture book called Liam's First Cut is a celebration of family, community, and neurodiversity as Liam, an autistic black boy, prepares for his first visit to the barbershop. She also has a follow-up book called The Season of Yes, which is a jubilant tribute to Summer in the City. So welcome, Shantae. I'm so happy to have you. Hi, Jennifer. Thank you for having me today. I'm excited to be here and be in conversation with you. Yes. Um, I feel very like I've been very lazy in my life after reading your bio. It's like, what have I accomplished? <laughs> so, <laughs> so you've been busy. I've been a little bit busy. Yeah. I think I could say I wear a lot of different hats. I think that's fair to say. <laughs> I definitely think that's fair to say. So I can't wait to dive into this topic. And before we do, I want to just know a little bit more about you as far as what Tell us a little bit about your professional journey, because I always find that so interesting how we all landed in these roles as speech pathologists. How how did that happen for you? Um, for me, it started off kind of um, by accident, I guess you could say. I was thinking <laughs> that I was going to major in physical therapy or sports medicine. And then I happened to talk to someone who was a speech language pathologist that told me about the field. And I became intrigued. I knew that I liked the idea of working with children. I love the idea of having the versatility to work in lots of different settings. So after that conversation, I decided to apply for graduate school. Um, I went to graduate school in New Jersey. I'm a native of New Jersey. So I am a graduate of William Patterson University, University in New Jersey. Um, I've been here ever since I finished school. I went to undergrad in Maryland. Um, I attended a historically black college, Morgan State University in Baltimore, Maryland, which was a tremendous experience. Um, but when it was time for me to go to graduate school, I knew the program would be intense and I really wanted to go back home where I'd have my family support. So that's what led me back to New Jersey. And um, I have been in New Jersey ever since I worked. My career has spanned um, from, I think, every setting except for nursing homes. I've worked in the hospitals. I've worked in public schools. I've worked in private practice. I started my own private practice, and now I am working more so with professional development. Okay. <laughs> so you just listed about you know, 10 of the hats you, you've worn. Um, <laughs> and, and I love, I, this is why I love that question so much, because it is so interesting how we all landed here. I mean, some people know, oh, I've always known, but I feel that majority of the people I speak to, it just, life just led in this direction. And it wasn't necessarily part of the plan, which I think is, is re the really cool part of it. So it sounds like yeah. you knew you always wanted pediatric population that that was that was always the group you wanted to work with yes i think um i did not know about speech pathology as a field i didn't know that that's what i'd be called to do but i always felt called to work with children in some capacity before i went to school to become an slp i actually worked for the department of transportation and i worked with um child safety so in that role i felt like i like giving back to people through my profession. I like working directly with families. So it made sense when I started to make the transition to speech pathology and kids have always been my jam. Um, adults are cool. 
but I, I'd rather be with the kids. I love seeing the progress that we make. I like being a part of the beginning of their journey. So that always has felt right to me. And I love the opportunity to build those connections and build trust with families. Um, for me and coming from my perspective as a black SLP, I recognize that a lot of families of color didn't necessarily know about resources and intervention. And there was still a stigma attached to needing help. So um, being able to be a person of that community, a person who is now an expert in the field can bridge that gap and close the gap so that families feel more comfortable with knowing what is available to them, feeling empowered with um, the information so they can advocate for their children and seek out the the help and the resources that they need. Yeah, I that was so beautifully said. And I love the way you put that because you're exactly right. Not only does it help bridge that gap where parents feel more comfortable saying, hey, I, I need these supports. And, um, you know, there are resources that are available in the community that are just, you know, sp speak to me and that I feel like I have a connection with, but it's also, I love because now kids are seeing that they you know, oh, this is an option as a profession. And, mm -hmm. you know, that is huge that wanting to increase the diversity in this field. And so I think you're accomplishing so many things of, you know, helping the parents feel that they've got that support system and somebody that really understands and they feel comfortable with, but also that the youth you work with sees that, oh, wow, this is, I didn't even know this was a profession. I didn't even know this was an option. So I think that is really um, just, like I said, it was just beautifully said. Um, the Department of Transportation, I have so many questions, but I'm not going to go there. <laughs> I was like, that's a whole nother. I'm sure you, you've got, learned a lot doing that in itself. So, um, and so, you know, you went from, it sounds very clinical to what you're doing now is less clinical. It sounds like. So what is your current role look like? Um, so currently I operate a very small private practice. I still okay. work with children oh, okay. um, a few hours per week. Um, but for the most part, most of my days are composed of working on professional development. Um, as of, uh, let's see, I guess March of 2022, I started working with Bright Ideas Media, which is a company that provides professional development for speech language pathologists and beyond. Um, everything is virtual, but what I do is to help develop courses and curate experiences for SLPs to get the education that we need and that we want to continue our journey in the field. All the courses are, for the most part, provided by SLPs who are still in the trenches, still working every day. So we have not only that clinical experience, but also that day-to-day -day operational experience and can relate to those of us who are still doing that clinical piece every day. Um, my work with Bright Ideas started with the Equity Series, a conference that mm -hmm. I had created, um, I think in May of 2021. That was the first time that we did that event. And that conference was very dear to me. And I guess you could say a bit of a passion project. Mm -hmm. Again, recognizing that our field as SLPs is mostly made up of white women. I felt that there were courses, there was information that we needed that spoke to the rest of us. Even though we're majority white, um, the people that we work with are not. We work with diverse clientele, diverse patients, clients, students. So I wanted to create something that spoke to the needs of the marginalized community as well. And that was a virtual conference that started, like I said, in 2021, but has happened again in 2022. And I'm excited to do it again for 2023. Um, it really was great to see that people from all different backgrounds and all different experiences were able to relate to the content. And the courses don't only focus on um, black and brown students. It also focuses on individuals who are part of the LGBTQ community, autistic clients, all of those um, clients and family members who don't fit into the, the typical box, but still have very unique needs that we need to be aware of as we continue to treat them and work with them. Yeah, I I could not uh, like what you just said more. It's so critical and it's so important. And it's, and 
you're doing the work and it's, it's easy to say, oh, it needs to change. It needs to change, but you're out there, you're doing the work and it's, it is paying off because I will tell you, I just went to, you know, to Asha and I said, I felt a change is coming a much, it felt like no other year that it has felt where I feel like this next group that's coming in and even some that have been out there, it's time for change. And I sense it and big things are going to happen. And I'm really have an excitement for this field. And so much of it is based on what you just said, because it does, it, it's time. And so I love if somebody wants to access that equity series, is that they can still sign up versus, through Bright Ideas, correct? Um, the series itself just ended November 30th of 2022. Okay. A new conference will be coming out in May of 2023. But there okay. will be some courses that are available um, as of January from the conference that we will rerun. And you could sign up for those if you go to be the brightest.com. You yeah. could access all of those courses that will be available then. And just to go back to your point, I, mm -hmm. I also was at ASHA this past oh year. Oh, my gosh. And um, I know I missed you. We could have met in person. <laughs> I, I might cry. I <laughs> Yes. Um, but I have to say, I felt the same. I felt yeah. that it felt different. Um, yes. It was a little bit smaller in attendance from previous ASHA conventions that I had attended. But the diversity that I saw... The people that I spoke to, um, everyone is ready for something different. Everyone's acknowledging that the way that we've done things for a long time doesn't always work. And that's yeah. OK. I think people are starting to get, um, I love to say, get comfortable with being uncomfortable and yes. recognizing that we need to learn differently and sometimes unlearn some of the things that we learn, especially for those of us who've been in the field for a really long time. Um, and I'm so encouraged by the new generation that's coming up. I love how outspoken they are. I love that they're demanding um, that their value is seen early on and yes. that they're being supported in the graduate process as well as when they become new clinicians. So I'm really hopeful for the field and what's going to happen for us as clinicians and also for the people that we work with. Yeah, I, I, everything you just said, I could not agree with more. And it just felt so good to see just, it wasn't the sea of everybody that looked the same. It really uh -huh. was so refreshing. And I did, I uh -huh. came back and I said, there's a change of guard and it's, they're, they're, I, again, I felt more excited about just where the direction of this field is going than I have in a long time. So, um. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll have to figure out another place to meet because, <laughs> um, so let's get back into, and, so, and we will also put in the show notes, um, how to access any of these courses. So anyone that's listening can access them because I think you're exactly right. It's not, I think sometimes people think, oh, well that doesn't apply to me. No, it does apply to you because the people, the patients, the students that we work with, we need to understand how to best work with them regardless. And, and you're right. They are not all going to look like us and we need to make sure that we have that awareness. And so I, I think everybody, it should be like required coursework. So we'll put that in the show notes. Yeah. I agreed. Yeah. You know, it's interesting you say that because um, the reason why I got started on this journey with literacy and diverse yeah. books was because I worked with kids who didn't look like me and yeah. they had never really encountered someone that looked like me. They weren't used to someone who had skin as dark brown as mine or hair that looked like mine. And for a lot of them, it was innocent, but they were very curious. And sometimes they would say things that were honest, but sometimes a little brutal. You know, kids can be rough. They, they no, say no they filter. <laughs> no filter at all. And um, I'm like, ouch, I thought I was cute today, but apparently my hair looks crazy wild. Okay. <laughs> but it made me think that it's just from a lack of exposure. And, yes. um, you know, I can't gather up a whole bunch of different looking folks and bring them to school every day. But what I can do is introduce you to new characters through books. And that was the beginning of my diverse library. So in that school district that I was working in, um, I started off with just buying books that had 
different types of characters. It came from different countries and different places. Some of the characters spoke different languages and had to learn how to speak English now that they were here in America. Um, I used all picture books because it was important that they saw these illustrations. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing to see the change. It was a small change at first, obviously, because it was just within my, my speech room. But little by little, the teachers became interested and they wanted to borrow books and it started to spread throughout the school. So it was really cool to see the origin of it and how it just broadened. But it came from me recognizing that I don't work with people who look like me and they're going to see people who look like me as they enter the larger world. And I want to better prepare them for that. Yeah. And what a service, because you're right. It, it's, it truly is a disservice for, for us not to introduce these things to, to students and, and even, you know, not even other countries necessarily, but even with our own, the United States, I mean, New Jersey versus you know, some of the places I met in Colorado. I mean, it's just, there's so much diversity within our country that mm -hmm. it's really challenging to even understand what's going on within these walls, much less even the bigger world, but it, it does, it creates just a richer life and a better understanding. So, um, I, I think that's just incredible that you did that. And so it sounds like that really is, did you have an interest in literacy before doing that? Or was it really that thought of, okay, I want to introduce these concepts. What better way to do it than books? Or was it a bridge between the two? I always liked using books in therapy, um, but I found that the books that I had at school didn't look anything like the books that I was reading at home with my own daughters. And so the books that I was using were often books that were recommended by popular SLPs who I were fo following on social media or through their um, newsletters. And um, I found myself wanting to do a little bit more with it. So I started doing a little bit more research on literacy-based ther therapy and recognizing like what I was doing was an evidence-based practice, but there was so much more that I could do. And then I started looking at my book selection and how could I expand on a lot of these topics and reach the goals that I wanted to reach using books. And I noticed there was a very huge difference between the books that I chose to work with in school and the books that I would read to my younger daughter at home. And a lot of times the books that I had in school featured only animal and not people. And so I did a little bit more research and I recognized that that was part of the problem. Um, the more that kids see people, they're easy. it's easier for them to understand those lessons that we're reading books about. Like when we want to teach them about real world issues and life skills, it's easier for them to digest that information when they see a person as opposed to an animal. Often animals make it a little bit more palatable, but they really are able to apply it and then replicate the message when they see people. Then I notice like, okay, but the people can't always look the same. And that's when I started to think about finding diverse characters and again, trying to encourage our students, my students, to see people differently through a lens where you're looking out into a window of the world, but also introducing you into um, new worlds and new situations that you haven't seen and mirroring back your reflections. A lot of my students weren't seeing themselves in the books that I read at work, but I knew at home with my daughters, I wanted to make sure that I always found books that affirm their identity that made them feel proud of their skin color, made them feel proud of their hair, even though their hair may be different than the kids in their classroom. Um, I wanted them to know that there'll be other kids that you'll meet who don't look like you. There'll be kids who practice different customs and holidays and religion. So I was building a, a really diverse library to prep my kids at home, but I wasn't doing the same for my students at school. And, I, and as you mentioned, I felt like I was doing a disservice. So I took on the task to try to make sure that I felt that it was balanced for, for all of them so they could have that exposure and have that experience. So I guess to answer your question, um, I have always loved the books, but I just found that I needed to do better with the books that I was choosing and how I was using them. Yeah, just such a thoughtful approach to that whole, yeah, all of that. And it's so interesting, as you're saying, I'm thinking, you're right. I never thought about how many children's books feature animals. You know, I did early intervention forever and ever. And so I'm thinking back to my library, they're 90% animals. And so mm -hmm. you're exactly right. Why don't we have more? I mean, I understand they're fun and whatnot, but it does seem like there could be a better balance. So 
Yeah. Um, and do you have kind of, I mean, it's, you know, I love that you have this diverse library of books and being able to utilize those with students. Do you have a couple of ideas or activities of things that are your go-to or when you're getting started with a book with a student? Um, well, I'll tell you first that it is something that you have to be very intentional about. There okay. aren't a lot of books. When you go first go out looking at your bookstore, if you go online, the books that are going to be mar marketed to you first and foremost are not going to feature diverse characters. Um, when when I started doing research, I recognized that the majority of books, I think as of 2021, I think it might be maybe like 70% of books, children's books feature white characters. Mm -hmm. And then after that, the next highest group are animals. So less than less than a third of the books that are published feature diverse characters and hardly any feature kids with disabilities or kids who um, have either a family member or some sort of representation of LGBTQ community. So I'll say that first and foremost, it's, it's not something that you can just say like, oh, I'm going to start it today. And then all these books are going to appear to you. You have to be seeking it out. It's not what's marketed to you right, readily. Um, I do have some books that I do really love to use, like my go-tos for therapy. What I will say is that it's important to make sure you find a book that is um, quick to read. You want to be able to read it within like a 30 minute session so that the kids stay engaged and focused. Um, I love to be able to find a book that I have the hard copy and I can also find a copy online either through YouTube or some sort of free medium where I can say, hey, if you want to read it again at home with your family, you can. Because, you know, in especially in the school setting, you're not seeing the students every day and there may be some time in between your first and your second session and your follow-up session. So read it again at home or listen at home just to keep your parents, um, just to keep you aware of the information and then get your family involved as well. So I'll do that. Um, I also have book companions that I've created for some of the stories that I love and I'll send home activities that go with the books so to keep the learning going beyond the story, before the story and even during we'll have some activities so that it's never just a one session with just a book. We read it and then we're done. It could even go for a full month when I'm doing a full unit on a book. We could go for weeks because I really want to delve into the book, make sure that one, we're targeting all of your goals that are in your IEP, but also making sure that you understand the concepts, the vocabulary and the lessons that are meant to be learned by this particular book. So I'm so glad that you called out just that it isn't as easy as I'm just going to go to Amazon and order a bunch of books that feature diverse populations. And hearing yeah. you say that, that number is really eye-opening. I would have never thought, and that just is, we, we, it tells me we need to do better. That uh -huh. is crazy. So I love yeah. that you called that out because that, I would have never thought that. Um, well, and I also like to call it out because I don't want people to feel like, how did I not know better? But part of the reason that you didn't know better is because the system is created so that you wouldn't know better. Yeah, you know, most yeah. of the books that are published are published by an industry that's putting out what they think is valuable. And what they think yes. is valuable are these stories. So the more that we purchase and seek out books that say otherwise, they'll recognize like, no, our consumers find value in books that are about disabled children and our mm -hmm. consumers want to find more books that feature black children and Asian children and Latinx children. So we have to change the system, but it's not our fault that we're buying the other books. That's what's marketed to us. That's what's produced more readily. Yeah. And as consumers, I mean, we need to keep that. That is important to remember that what you're buying and where you're spending your money and resources is what's speaking to these that, that oh, is supply and demand. So, I mean, that mm -hmm. is something for us to be mindful of is, you know, perhaps even, you know, what can we do to help the companies producing this understand that there is a bigger need and desire mm -hmm. for different. So I, I, I'm so glad you said that because I'm sure most people don't know that. And it's, that's, that's, we need to do better. We'll be right back to our interview. We just want to take a brief moment to shout out the company that makes this show possible, Med Travelers. 
If you are a therapist interested in traveling, visit medtravelers.com to explore the amazing benefits that Med Travelers has to offer. Featuring short and long-term contract opportunities at leading facilities across the country with higher earning potential, W-2 employee status, and a flexible schedule, Med Travelers is your advocate for career success. Visit medtravelers.com to begin your travel adventure today. And now back to the show. And, and I love how you incorporate the books over a period of time because you're right. There's so much you can do with literacy and it's not just a, you know, okay, we're going to read it and then be done, or we're going to read it, ask a few questions and be done. But I mean, as you're talking about what you're doing with books, I'm thinking of the books that I've read of where I've learned about something I never would have learned about. It almost is like, it takes you to a different place. And it, you know, for a student, let's say that's living in a rural community somewhere in the Midwest versus being able to learn about students in New York City or kids, it's it it allows you to almost transport yourself to something that may not be something you'd ever have the opportunity to learn about otherwise. So it's I think we forget just how much we can do with literacy and books. Yeah. They're truly transformative and they can yeah. take you to a world that you may otherwise never visit, but now you know that it does exist and you can yeah. see that people who may not live where you live, may not look like you look, may speak other languages, but they also have some similar experiences to you in another part of the country or another part of the world. One of my favorite books to read um, is called The Name Jar and it's about a little girl who comes to America with her family from Korea. And I remember the first time I read that book with older students, maybe like fifth grade, they weren't sure about Korea. Like, where where is that? Is that China? Like, no, it's not China. It's something different. So it opened up an opportunity for us to have a whole other conversation that I didn't even plan for. But then in looking at the illustrations, we were able to talk about how languages differ how when we write language, written language can look differently for other people than it does for us with English. It just opens the opportunity for folks to see something very different. This book in particular spoke to me even as an adult because it was about a girl who was afraid to share her name. She has a Korean name and she's afraid that now that she's in this new country and this new culture that she might be mocked because her name is different. And I remember being a little girl and feeling like my name Shantae was so different and having people butcher my name or call me something other than Shantae and not feeling the courage to correct them, not recognizing or owning that my name is part of who I am. It's part of my identity. And this book talks about that it's at the end of the story. I hate to give a spoiler, but at the end of the story, <laughs> she does in fact own her name and she understands that it's part of who she is and it's part of who people need to get to know. And even as a grown adult woman, I really felt touched and moved by this story. And that often happens for me with picture books. There are lessons that are meant for kids, but I think adults will learn so much from them as well. So um, I, I highly recommend picture books. Don't think that they're only for the younger grades. They're really great to use with the older kids too. Yeah, that's a great reminder. And, and I think it, it, those things do speak to us because I, even th what happens to us in those first few years and those that we, what's imprinted, it doesn't just go away. So you're right. It's very interesting. Sometimes reading that it's like, oh gosh, I, this really resonates with me for this reason. So you're right. Even with some of our older students, there's probably a lot. Uh, and I will say it's interesting because I, as a Jennifer would have loved to be a Shantae because I yeah. was so envious of anybody who had a name that wasn't the same as everybody else. So it's really interesting that, for, and I'm sure, who knows, had I had a more unique name, I may have said, I wish I want to be a Jennifer, but yeah, <laughs> but yeah, so, but I am like, oh, I love your name. So, but I understand oh, as a you. kid, it's, it's hard when you're, you don't want to yeah. stand out as a child. So it is, I love that reminder, just own it, be proud. You're you're the only you. So yeah. Yeah. And well, I can I wanted, tell you, I definitely wanted to be a Jennifer. I had a Jennifer, <laughs> two Jennifers in my, and, really? uh, or Tracy or Christina, something a little bit, <laughs> something common I wanted at the time. Oh gosh. That's so, uh, what an interesting perspective because yeah, I, 
was I always like, ah, oh, why did you? Everybody has this name. So interesting <laughs> perspective. Well, I want to jump. So again, you mentioned, you know, as mentioned in your in the bio, you are also a published author, and so tell us a little bit about that and what what was your inspiration and about your book books. Yes. So um, when I started this journey with looking to build out my own library, I figured a lot of other SLPs probably were doing the same thing as me and not recognizing that our books were looking um, the same and that we were telling the same stories over and over again. So I started sharing my journey publicly on um, social media. And I, as I would find a book, I would post it on Instagram or Facebook and talk a little bit about the book and how I could use it in my therapy. And then one day someone said to me, oh, that's nice, but where's your book? And then they said, oh, I don't have a book. <laughs> but at that time, I had been considering co-writing a book with someone and that person had come up with the idea for the book, but then decided not to do it. And I didn't feel comfortable taking that story and writing it on my own. But when that person asked me, where was my book? It started getting my, my thoughts going. And one morning I woke up, I sat up in the bed and I said to my husband, I said, what do you think about a story about a little boy who goes to the barber shop for his very first haircut? Because there's so many books about girls and their hair, but I don't see a lot of books about boys and getting your first haircut is huge. It's such a big deal for many families and many communities. And um, he was like, oh, I think that's a really good idea. So I decided to go with it. And then as I started writing the story and as I started developing the character of Liam, I realized that Liam was becoming so much like my nephew, children that I've worked with. And I said, there's no way around this. Liam is clearly autistic. So I wrote the story and um, I wanted it to be more so about celebrating Liam Yes, he's different. Yes, Liam has some different needs to help him prepare for this first day, but he's just as excited as anybody else when they're going for the first time of doing anything. Um, he can't wait to get to the barber shop. He loves hanging out and the idea of having this new routine with his dad. So um, the story itself is just about how he manages his expectations, how he processes all the sensory information, but more so than anything, it's just about that rite of passage and being able to accomplish something for the first time that you've been waiting for for a really long time. I think that is so cool that it's like, well, why? I, and I love that someone called you out on that and kind of spurred yeah. you, to, you know, because that is sometimes like, okay. So yeah. was there, was there like a fear or a hesitation or did you just feel like I feel called to do this. I need to do this. Um, there was definitely a fear and a hesitation. Um, the, the time between when I had the idea, I remember saying it out loud to a girlfriend and then she was like, well, you have to do it now because you've said it out loud. It has to happen. And then um, I was introduced to who would become my publisher at an event. And when I pitched the idea for the book to the publisher, she fell in love with it right away. So that really confirmed for me that this is something that I need to do. And then the writing came pretty quickly and pretty easily. I've always liked writing. And I remember even as a kid writing and creating my own stories in therapy, I'll often have kids write an alternate ending to the story to work on their language mm -hmm. skills. So um, it, that part came naturally to me. The next fear, the next biggest hurdle was when the book was done and then it was time for it to be actually published and released to the public because now I had to share my little private baby with the world and now I was open to the responses and to the criticism. And what's really interesting is that when I when I wrote the book, I wrote the book and it's written under Tay Jones, which is yeah. a nickname for Shantae and Jones, my, my husband's last name. Um, I didn't want to write it under Shantae Glover, which is what most people know me as professionally, because in my brain, for some reason, there were going to be two separate things, as if I could separate SLP Shantae and author Tay. But obviously, the two came together um, and I became a little bit worried, like, what are people going to think? Will they love the book as much as I do? Will I get any pushback from 
folks who feel like I didn't portray Liam accurately as an autistic character. Um, there was a lot of that. And I can say that the biggest reward that I've received after putting this book out has been hearing from kids, that kids are able to say, like, I see myself in Liam. Um, Liam looks like me. Liam looks like me and my dad. Or even kids who had never gone to a real barber shop, but now wanting to go to the barber shop with their dad because of reading the book. Um, they had gotten haircuts at home or had gone to more of like a kitty salon. Um, so that's been super rewarding. I have, if there's any negative feedback out there, I haven't read it. <laughs> I've had mostly really positive reviews and positive feedback from the story, which has been amazing because my whole purpose was to provide something that was happy and joyful and, and write a story that is from um, a Black author's experience, but not just for Black children, a story that's for any and everyone. It's relatable. And in a setting that I, I truly love, I love sitting in the barbershop and people watching. So I had hoped that people who read the story would love it as much as I do. And for the most part, I'm happy to say that they have. So that's been amazing. Yeah. And you are right. I mean, what a vulnerable place to put yourself into where it is almost like, okay, once I put it out there, like you can't unring that bell. But that is what I want people, and especially, you know, whether you're a new grad or even been in the field for a while is like, don't let those, that, those thoughts keep you from doing things because we need those types of, of resources and books. And I'm so glad that you just pushed through that. So, because it is, it's, and I'm thinking I've worked with several autistic kids that were, that, that was a huge concern. The parents getting the haircut is like, I don't know how we're going to do this. They won't, I know they're not going to like it. I know it. This would be so great also just for parents to read with their kids as a way of, hey, you know, before we go do this, let's, you know, it's a way to practice and read about somebody else's experience so that then they're, okay, I got, I can do this. Um, so I'm so glad that you didn't let that fear of the judgment cause you to not do this. Cause what a, what a great resource now we have. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. I, my, my brother is a barber and oh, cool. um, in talking to him to help get a little bit more mm -hmm. research and, and feedback for the story, one of the things that he shared with me is that um, he wishes that more parents would be more upfront and be open and say like, hey, by the way, my son is scared of that vibration from a clipper or just say, you know, my, my son is autistic or my daughter doesn't like loud sounds whatever it is, he would like to have more of those conversations before because it could help him prepare and help him get the child more acclimated to the experience. So that was part of the story too, where you see dad and the barber having a brief exchange where he lets him know like, hey, remember, we may need more patience and care because this is Liam's first time and Liam is in fact autistic. Um, and that part has been helpful to a lot of families. Folks have sent pictures and written back showing them in the barbershop with a copy of the book or will tell me that we read it the week prior to the going to the barbershop and it really made a huge difference. And that's really rewarding too, knowing that I'm helping families to do something that's seemingly so easy and natural for some folks, but not as easy for others. But now having this as a resource has been helpful to them. Yeah, I think that I that's such a great piece that's been incorporated because there is, it's improving, but there is still a lot of stigma and shame with families having to say, well, that my child is different for these reasons. And so this does normalize it. Like, you know, it's the more you can share up front and communicate about what you need, what they need, it, it'll help the experience. But I think it probably helps tremendously for them to see, oh, okay. So that I, yeah. I love that you added that. So if, if someone wants to purchase the book, so again, it's under Tay Jones is your author mm -hmm. is, uh, name. Um, and where is it? Amazon, any place that normally sells books or. Yep. It's available anywhere that sells books, Amazon, Barnes and Noble. I also have it on my website, tayjones.com. Um, Target, anywhere where you purchase books online, you can find it. There's also e-versions available. So I think you could find it on Apple Books or Kindle as well. 
So did you go into a Target and see your book there at one point in time? And say, <laughs> I went into Barnes and Noble and saw my book there oh. and kind of freaked out a little bit, <laughs> um, which is really cool. I love how social media unites us, whether yeah. we really don't know each other and are on opposite sides of the world. But someone went to their Target and saw the book in Target and was like, hey, I know her and sent a picture of it. Oh. So that was really cool, too. <laughs> Yeah, I, it would have been hard for me not to hold it up and start yelling, this is me. This, no, but yeah. it, <laughs> security. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> no, and I, I mean, I'm thinking too, what a cool gift for, I mean, whether it's the holidays or just even a clinician that you know. I think this would be a great beginning to developing that library that we talked about, where we know this is going to cover, again, not only black, uh, autistic. I mean, so you're hitting on a few different areas that it's not just this standard, <laughs> yeah. you know, look and, and behavior. So I, I love yeah. that. I also wanted to write a book that um, showed a black family all together. And I also wanted it to just be a feel good, happy book about Black kids doing regular everyday things. And this little boy is the star of the story. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes books about um, the Black experience might focus on oppression or struggle or our dark past in America. And um, I wanted people to see that our lives aren't always marked by struggle, that we, we go to the barbershop, we go to school, we go to work, we go to the store, we do every, do all those things that everyone else does. So it was important to me that it was a story that made you feel good, no matter who you are, no matter what you look like, that at the end of the story, you feel good and you feel happy that Liam was able to get that haircut. Yeah. And that's such a great point. I mean, you're, I'm so glad you're saying these things aloud because they really are so important and things that, you know, I'm even as you said that I'm thinking, and again, this just goes to show, you know, what the, the, the my experience, you know, as a white woman, how different it is. And that there, imagine as a, a child being, you, so many of the books you're reading are about all the bad things that happen. I mean, that, that, so I'm, I'm so glad you're saying those things because the more I'm thinking about it, it's like, gosh, you're exactly right. That's, that would, that would get to you where you're just thinking there's more to my life than, than this. Yeah. So, um, so I think those are important things too, as we're thinking about the students and populations we're working with, that making sure that you are incorporating not only, yeah, I think it's really important to under have a good awareness and understanding about the terrible things that did happen, because we need to understand that so that it never happens and we can be better. But um, I think it's also just, yeah, just the everyday things that are really what our students and families are doing. So I, I, yeah, you're, you're making me think <laughs> and I love it. Yeah, so I'm glad. <laughs> I'm <Yes>. glad. <laughs> and you know, as we, so you've got this book, um, and again, it's so um, admirable because it's, you know, even myself, I've thought, oh, we need to do this better. This needs, but it's easy to say it and think it, you're really putting things into action. And that is not something that everybody does. So um, I just, I think that's really admirable, but Thank as you. we think too, about just even, um, I'm sure this is a loaded question in that, you know, we're thinking about just even the lack of diverse materials in general and resources for SLPs to use with their student populations. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on that? And do you have any recommendations for resources that, that can be used as well? I think I, I feel like I'm starting to see a shift in that area as well, where we're seeing more companies produce materials that are more diverse, mm -hmm. where they're more representative of your caseload, or even if it's not your caseload represented, representative of the world in general. So um, I, I won't name a any companies in particular, but I remember having cards from a particular company that always looked the same. And then when they did start to introduce characters of color, they were associated with things that were negative. So yes. I have refrained from using those products um, 
Jenny Bjorum, I this is not a paid sponsorship or ad or yeah. whatever, but I do appreciate that she has very inclusive yes. cards, picture cards that can focus on a lot of different aspects of your your therapy and your practice. She even has characters that show children with um, cochlear implants, mm-hmm. characters who are in wheelchairs, characters who have are wearing hijab. So you see a very diverse array of characters and it and makes the kids feel like, hey, that looks like me or that looks like someone in my family. And you feel valued, you feel supported when you see yourself. It makes you feel like I do have a place in this society. And it makes you feel like my my therapist, my SLP gets it. She she's here and she's concerned for me. Um and not to say that you aren't if you're not using diverse materials, but it sends a clearer message to your students when they walk in the room and they see decor that looks like them and looks like their friends and looks like their family and looks like people that they don't maybe know personally, but want to get to know. They feel like this is a safe space. This is a space where I can learn and I can grow and I can build a connection with this person. So um I think that it goes well beyond books. I think that we do have a duty to make sure that we're we're decorating yeah. with diverse materials, that we're trying to utilize um, cards, books, whatever you can that shows um, more inclusivity as opposed to one type of character all the time. We shouldn't be telling one type of story all the time. Um, so... Even movies, I'll leave it, you know, even when we're showing our movies, thinking about what types of movies are you showing? Um, you know, what what clips are you playing for your for your students, making sure that there's diversity is there there as well. Yes, absolutely. And I also know the cards and <laughs> but uh, but so you're right. And another um one is um BVG SLP. Uh-huh, uh, Melinda Gibbons, uh-huh. she does such great and in, incorporates yeah. a lot of diversity in her materials. And, and it is, it's a nice to see more of that where it shouldn't, you know, <laughs> we want it to get to a place where, like you said, it's not hard and to find these and seek them out. And you shouldn't have to work so hard to uh-huh. be able to increase what resources you have and have a more diverse library of, of books and activities. And, you know, something you said too, that is, how often do we, especially with our students, if you don't have rapport, if they don't feel like they can trust you, you're not going to see, I mean, it's like any of us. If we don't feel like, I don't feel seen, I don't feel heard, I don't feel like I matter, then it really messes with that ability to build that rapport. And then you're not going to, you know, you don't have as much skin of the game. It's like, whatever, you know? And so you're right. When we're not showing up and showing them, Hey, you matter to me. You are seen, you are heard. And this is how I'm going to do that. I mean, I think Uh we would see a big shift in just motivation. And, and, and again, they, it just, we want to be seen. We want to know we matter. And yeah, Yeah. that's critical. Yep. Absolutely. First and foremost, you know, even Mm -hmm. The littlest of students, they want to know that you are there for them and that you care and that you see them, that you really yeah. see who they are. You don't just see their their disability. You don't just see their their deficits, that you see them as a person and that you you respect that and you yeah. want to make sure that they feel that they are in a safe space, like I said. Yeah. And sometimes it's just, you know, that's what it's like. Sometimes it just takes that one adult in their life that can really shift that. And so, mm-hmm. you know, we, that's a big responsibility that we have to remember that I remember I worked at a, a, a schools here um, in Colorado and I've always done title one low income. I, I speak Spanish. So I've always worked with Spanish speaking students and that's just my love. And there'd be times where I'd be working with eight kids at one time and they all have different needs. And I'd think, what am I doing? I'm not accomplishing anything. And I finally had to come to the realization, no, I'm helping them feel seen and that they matter. Even if we're not working on WH questions, you know, that sometimes can go just as far. So we have to remember that's a, yeah. that's a responsibility that we have as, yeah. as professionals. So. I, I love that you just said that because I think sometimes we do get caught up in in just the data or feeling like 
am I am I following my lesson plan or my therapy plan yeah. for today? And you start to feel like, what am I doing here? But mm-hmm. connection is a huge piece. Yes. And you might be the only positive part of that child's day. And yeah. that's something it's a huge responsibility, but that's something to to really be proud of and and know that that matters. That makes a big difference in their life. So um, I'm hopeful that, you know, there will be a lot of kids that later on they'll remember Miss Shante was really cool and she really cared about me. Yeah, no. And you're right. It's I mean, that is sometimes they say like the students that are just kind of on a, a path or, you know, just could easily fall through the cracks. It just takes one person to show. And so mm-hmm. that, it's like, always remember that it's something you might be that person. You don't know. So, yeah. Um, okay. So when, uh, when switching gears a little bit, so back to the bright ideas, um, and it sounds like, you know, as far as some of the courses, so you do some courses on literacy on uh-huh. the equity series. Um, what else, I mean, in, are there specific courses that if people, we got the equity series, which I think should be like mandatory, <laughs> you got, yeah, everybody should do that. Um, what are the other courses that you would recommend if somebody wants to learn more about literacy or anything else we've talked about? Um, in general, we have courses on just about anything you might feel like you need to to brush up on. Um, we just did a speech sound disorder series that focused on Um, not just apraxia, but just speech sound disorders in general. So if you feel like you are missing anything from assessment to intervention, that series is currently running and is available to, to, for you to register. Um, We've had courses and we'll have more courses coming up on trauma informed care. I'm super excited about this one happening in January about trauma informed care, understanding the principles of trauma informed care and the impact that it has, not just on um, cognitive abilities, but also on language and um, communication, and then how it also impacts our students socially. So we also have another speaker that will be talking about the SLP's role in the school to prison pipeline, which should be amazing. I'm really excited about that one as well. Then um, we have some stuff coming up Part of what I'm doing with Bright is making sure that we have content like the equity series all the time. Yes. So um, we have those courses that are happening. Then we'll have some supervision courses because, you know, we we need those courses that are required for your ASHA certification. But the supervision courses are also going to um, keep into play and target how your own experiences may impact you as a supervisor. So um, being aware of your own biases and how that could impact you, whether you're supervising a clinical fellow or a, a employee. Um, so that's a different perspective, looking at supervision from a different lens that's coming up. Um, we have, we'll be doing some more on AAC coming up soon and looking at AAC from um, a bilingual perspective as well. So I haven't seen a lot on that. And I was really interested to make sure that that incorporated, that's offered for individuals who work with bilingual students, specifically Spanish speaking students who need AAC. So that will be coming up in the early spring. Um, The equity series comes back in May. We have the SLP summit, which happens twice a year. The next one is happening in January and that conference is virtual and it is free to register. I know. So you can earn, you can earn up to eight hours of CEUs by attending that course. Um, the only fee is if you are part of the ASHA registry and you want to have your participation submitted, but otherwise it's free and who doesn't love free, right? Yeah. And um, this one that's coming up will have courses for pediatrics as well as adult. Um, so really cool stuff happening with that one too. I think we have um, Jesse Ginsburg speaking. So she'll be doing stuff on um, autism Mm -hmm. and strategies for sensory Mm -hmm. integration and sensory processing with your students. Um, We'll have some stuff on literacy and reading, not with me, with another speaker. Um, uh, Oh, and also just thought language. That one's going to happen too. So that should be really cool. And again, it's free. So if you just mark your calendars and make sure you can watch it either live or on demand, you have access to those throughout the month of January. 
And you could just head over to um, be the brightest.com to mm-hmm. find out more about any of those courses for the SLP Summit or any of the other series that will be coming up in the new year. Oh my gosh. I love so much. I The school to prison pipeline, I think that is, I'm, I mean, just so many, and even the supervision course, it's like you're taking the things that we need to know about and just aren't covered and aren't discussed. And the, that right there, just some of the things you mentioned, you know, the bilingualism at AAC, that the, these are the things that I'm just so glad that you're in this role because you're taking such critical information and helping it now be that the masses can access it and learn from it because it really, you know, when we know better, we do better. And Mm -hmm. it's like now, once you know some of these things, you've got to, we've got to do better. And so, yeah, um, I am definitely going to be signing up for that one. So and again, we'll put all of that in the show notes so people can access it. And yeah, that summit is, it, I can't, I still can't believe it's free. It's just like, how? But, um, <laughs> okay. So what is next for you professionally? What other, what's your next hat? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, my next hat, I guess my next project is still going to be with my author role. So I'm working on getting my next book out, which is due to be released in the spring. Um, it's called The Season of Yes, and that one is based on my love for summer and spending summers in the city. Uh, so that's what I'm working on now. And then continuing to curate these professional development experiences for SLPs. And I am taking on one additional role. I am working with Rutgers University in Newark, New Jersey as a clinical educator as well. Yay. Oh, my gosh. That's amazing. I Yeah. Would have loved to have uh, Shantae at my university. So, I, uh, I, they're the um, students are very lucky that they're going to have oh, the opportunity you. to work with you. So, um, yeah. Okay. So, um, before we finish, I always like to finish with just like a fun kind of a couple of lightning round questions. Um, okay. And I, um, I don't see you on there. Do you still see yourself on the screen, Shantae? I do. You don't see me anymore? No, I, but that doesn't... Oh, no. That, oh, you do? Okay. Yeah. It's like a little S appeared and you went away. So I don't know. Oh. Okay. So I just wanted to make okay. sure, but I, don't, I have no idea what... All of a sudden it was just like, you're gone and there's there's an S. So yeah. I don't know. Okay. So a couple of just like fun lightning round questions as we wrap up. Um, okay. So the, I always have to do a would you rather question. So, and I'll be interested to know about this one because... You do live in a, a very urban area, um, but I don't know if you have a car living in the urban area, but okay. Would you rather never be stuck in traffic again or never get another cold? Uh, never be stuck in traffic again. Me? That's, I was like, yes, I'll take all the colds. <laughs> like I, <Yeah>. can, <laughs> I can medicate. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So- Next one. If you could travel anywhere in the world over winter break, this coming winter break, with the snap of your fingers, where would it be? Ooh. Um, geez. I think Greece. Oh. I've been wanting to visit Greece. They have what seems to be lovely beaches. I just want to be somewhere warm and beautiful over winter break oh. and enjoy the ocean. That sounds amazing. Yes, I Maybe that's where we'll meet up. <laughs> yeah, do that. <laughs> take, take me with you. <laughs> okay. Um, and then the last one. Okay. So what one piece of advice would you give yourself on the day you graduated with your master's? Oh, this is a good one. I actually um, wrote a post about this, writing to my younger version of me. Mm-hmm. And I would tell her it gets better. I would tell her that um, everything that you felt, everything that you experienced was for a purpose and that it becomes amazing and you're going to exceed your own expectation. That's what I would tell her. I would say like, yeah, it, it gets really, really good. Oh, just give me the chills. I love that. <laughs> um, Thank you. That's a, that's a beautiful piece of advice. So Thank you. Well, I have loved every second with you. I've learned so much and yeah. I 
really am excited to check out these courses and are, I'm going to um, look into that today. And I encourage everybody else to as well. Also, um, Liam's First Cut, which I think is just, again, it should be part of everybody's library. And um, thank you for just all that you've contributed to this field. You've really made a positive impact. And I'm just really, I think we we need more Shantae. <laughs> Glover <laughs> Jones is in this field. So if you could clone yourself, that'd be great. But um, so <laughs> thank you for all that you've done. And thank you for spending some time with us today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure having this conversation with you. And I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much. And that wraps up this episode. Thank you for tuning into SLP Full Disclosure. For more information about this episode, check out the show notes on our website at medtravelers.com slash SLP Full Disclosure. And don't forget to leave us a review and subscribe so you never miss a guest. Are you interested in becoming a travel SLP? Visit medtravelers.com to learn more and explore the exciting opportunities we offer at top level facilities across the country. Also, a special thanks to Jonathan Carey for producing this episode and Aiden Dykes for the music and editing. And as always, this episode was powered by Med Travelers. See you next time.